Father, we thank you for the songs that have been sung, the prayers that have been prayed, for those that have taken time out of their schedule to spend time with us today. We ask that you will bless this word that we're about to look into and that it will fall upon the good soil of our heart and gain great root. We just thank you, God, just for just loving us enough to provide us with direction, correction, and most of all, God, that you provide us with uh, the way, the truth, and the life which is your son. Father, as we look into this, we ask that you will just reveal yourself even more. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. We have come to the end of the road. And of this series that we are doing called How to Be a Perfect Christian. So this is the fourth episode, and it is the last episode. As we have looked through this, we have talked about things such as, in episode one, we talked about a perfect Christian is one who conforms to the man-made standard of the Christian faith in any given age. Episode two, we talked about it's impossible to get the maximum level of holiness if you're currently attending a church that is focused on the wrong things, namely anything other than you. And then last week we talked about the only way for us to, uh, no, last week, yeah. Uh, perfect Christians never let anyone get close enough to your life to see what a mess it is below the surface. And we looked at all those situations and we talked about what it is to not be perfect based upon those things. And I told you that this was based upon this series was based upon a book that I read last year called How to Be a Perfect Christian. Your comprehensive guide to flawless spiritual living. And I reminded everyone that it was a book based upon satire. And satire is nothing more than the use of humor, irony, exaggeration, or ridicule to expose and criticize people's stupidity or vices, particularly in the context of contemporary politics and other topical issues. So the satire was they would bring out points, but the points were made in order to cause you to see what the true point was and is. And so now we have come again to our fourth episode of this series. And this time we're going to talk about the Bible. And the satire is this. When we say the Bible is inerrant, what we mean is that it's without any error in any truth claim that it makes unless it contradicts any preconceived cultural or emotional viewpoints you bring to the text. That's the satire. The reality is the Bible is a record of God's revelation to humanity. One we must not only trust but live by. I want to say that one one more time because the Bible is a record of man's revelation to humanity, one we must not only trust, but live by. I have had the opportunity of interacting with folks. In fact, I was one of those folks that knew the Bible, but didn't live a lick of it. And because I didn't live a lick of it, I had complications in my life. But once I started living it, things started changing. So as we look into it today, we're going to go to 2 Timothy, the third chapter, and we're going to start at that 10th verse. 2 Timothy, the third chapter, looking at the 10th verse. And it says, you, however, have followed my teachings. This is Paul talking to Timothy. My conduct, my aim in life, my faith, my patience, my love, my steadfastness. 
my persecutions and sufferings that happened to me at Antioch, at Iconum, at Lystra, which persecutions I endured, yet from them all the Lord rescued me. Indeed, all who desire to live a godly life in Christ Jesus will be persecuted. While evil people and impostors will go on from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it. And from your childhood, you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Father, we thank you for your word. We ask that it will fall upon the good soil of our hearts and that we will grow thereby in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's take a couple moments today and just talk about this Bible situation. The satire is this, you can trust your feelings in tandem with the ever-shifting cultural standards of theological truth. You can trust your feelings in tandem with the ever-shifting cultural standards of theological truth. What that is saying is, if you feel that it is not the right thing to do, then you don't have to do it. Now, the contradiction to that is we talked about on Tuesday during Bible study about the love of God. And it, it got to the point where the question was, what does the love of God really mean? And we came up with that the love of God is this process that we go through learning to love someone unconditionally. And guess what we discovered? Everybody in that room still has some growing to do in achieving the love of God. In loving a person unconditionally. Not just loving a person, but loving every person unconditionally. Now, if you say that you feel that you have the love of God in you, I could probably bring up a name or I could probably think of a person and you would be like, well, yeah, I guess I do need to work on loving that person a little bit better. Now, if it's the person sitting beside you, just look straight ahead and won't nobody know that that's the person that you're thinking about when I say that. I say look straight ahead. I ain't say grab their hand. But anyway. Now, what this line brings out the fact is that Paul is bringing out that our feelings can be deceptive. Our feelings can cause us not to see the scripture for what it is really saying. So us believing or be thinking that our feelings are going to line up with the word of God every time, most of the time, some of the time, one time, sometimes doesn't work. When God says, love those that persecute you or show love to those that persecute you, that doesn't go with a lot of people's feelings. But that's what God says. And then folks will tell you, well, you just let folks run all over you and you just, but it's not you that they're running over, it's You giving God glory to work in your situations. Have you let me let me step real quick and ask you this. Have you ever been mad at anybody? Now, again, if it's a person that you sit beside, just look straight ahead. They won't know that you, that's the person we're referring to right now. Have you ever been mad at somebody? And then God says, do something nice for them. And what do you tell God? I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. I ain't doing nothing. Ain't, well, okay. What I would do, I'd be like, Lord, the devil trying to tell me to do something nice. I ain't, you, 
did you hear what they just said? Did you see what they just done? See, it contradicts how we feel. But the Bible says when you do good to those that have done bad to you, it's just like you putting burning coals upon them, coals of conviction, coals of of of, of, of pain so that they can realize that they have done wrong towards you. I can't remember what movie it was, but there was a movie I, I remember seeing and the, and the lady just kept telling them, things are going to keep being bad for you till you do right by me. Things going to, till you do right by me. Things going to keep going bad till you do right by me. And it ended up that he finally did right by her and he was blessed, and she was also. So, looking at this process, the Bible becomes our roadmap, becomes our direction, becomes our guide for us to reflect Christ in the world. Notice what I said, to reflect Christ in the world, not to fall in compliance with the world's standards or the world's way of doing business because especially in the United States, what do we teach folks? Beat everybody down so you can be the victor. Be on top. Drop kick everybody. Kick the ladder out from underneath them. Do all this. You need to be the best. But the Bible's contradiction to that is the fact that it says if you want to be the top person, you got to be the servant of everybody. If you want to be the leader, then you got to be the best follower. It brings out this contradiction or this paradox, as one, as one writer has put, this paradox that if I want to be at the top, then I have to learn how to be the lowest. If I want to understand how to be uh, fulfilled, then I have to understand how to be broken. And so in order to understand how the Bible says to do things, it causes a conflict with how we feel how things should be done. Every good work is the ultimate goal of our lives. And the mastery and use of scripture is not a means to an end. Nor is it, nor is it an end in itself. God did not just give us the Bible to satisfy our curiosity. But what he did is he, he gave it for us to become a uh, reflection or a example of how to help other people to mature and to grow spiritually. One of the things that I have learned is that there ain't too many things that happen that have not happened before. And because of that, there are people that have been successful in overcoming those challenges. And as we connect, as we become that body, as we become those people that work and operate together like we talked about last week, we realize that we can help somebody to overcome something that they're going through instead of them giving up. Instead of them feeling as if there's no other way. And as we have created a community of people that are transparent and are communicating with one another. We help each other to have victory. That's how we provoke each other to righteousness. That's how we provoke each other to uh, good godly living is because we have this interaction and when we're ready to give up, somebody's there to say, listen, I've been through that same thing and I can now help you to have victory in that situation. For we must realize that it's not about us, for we are Christ's workmanship, for we are, I'm sorry, for we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God has prepared beforehand, and that we should walk in them. That's Ephesians, the second chapter, the tenth verse. That we are God's workmanship. He has placed us here for us to be this created example, this mirror of or this reflection of Christ for the world to see. 
And this is all throughout Scripture. As we look at Scripture, we can discover that God has set all this up. He has placed things, examples in there. One of the funniest things I remember, I was talking to a, a, a guy when I was in the military about the Bible. And he says, you know, one of the things I, I say about the Bible, especially that Old Testament, there's a bunch of killing in there, it's, it's murder, it's all this nonsense going on. He said, now, if I wrote the book, I wouldn't have had none of that in there. And I say, well, that's what God's trying to show you. He's, just, he's trying to show you that he's taking these imperfect people with all these deficiencies, and he's still able to cause his will to be uh, manifest in the earth. And he said, well, if I would have wrote that book, I wouldn't have had none of that. I wouldn't have had no... My brother killing the brother. I want to, you know, he it, because most of the time when we think about writing a book about something that we we always we only want to talk about the good stuff. But the thing about God, God wants us to know that there's no person that He's not able to save. There's no person that He cannot hear their voice when they cry out to Him. That anybody, everybody can be. A part of his kingdom. And a real quick alley to run down is this. A lot of people talk about God sends folks to, to hell. And I'm just going just gonna to jump on this real quick because it just it ran through my mind. So I want to go ahead and talk about it. This is what God says. God says, if you don't want to be with me, I have a place for you to be. Isn't that simple? Yeah. Yeah. He says, if you don't want to be with me, I'm not going to force you to be with me. So I have a place for you to be. Now, I can't make it no simpler than that. But that's 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 the deal. You made this, the decision that you don't want to be with me, so you don't have to be with me. So, when it's said like that, can you really say that God sends people to hell? No, you can't say that because it's a decision. He enables us to make a decision. He has made us free will creatures whereby we get to make a decision, especially once we have been presented with the gospel, what we want to do. Isn't that something? Now, I want to do a real quick example of how we think about the Bible. I want everybody to close your eyes for a minute. Just for a quick, now it won't even be a full minute. Just close your eyes for a minute. I want you to point to north, the direction north. I want everybody to point north right now. Everybody point north right now. Everybody point north right now. Everybody point north right now. I'm waiting on everybody to point north right now. All right, I see all the fingers. Everybody open your eyes and look around. All right. All right, so as we can see, everybody had their different version of where north was, right? Everybody had their, 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 uh, their opinion of where north is. But guess what? North is that way. No, y'all wasn't right. Y'all wasn't right. Look at talk, folks talking about, I was somewhat, wait a minute. Now I'm right. Now, uh, uh, now I'm right. But, but, but now, my, <laughs> my point in, in, in saying this is this, is that there has to be a standard that we all comply with. Because everybody has their opinion on what the direction is. And the word of God is our standard. The complication is when I just know north is this way. I know it's that way. I feel it's that way. However, when you are going up against the established standard of what north is, you realize 
You have a decision to make. Are you going to stay in, stay wrapped around what you decided North is going to be? Or are you going to follow what North is? Now, there's going to be some folks that can say, well, you know, there, there, there's, there's some sayings about the Bible. You know, there's some inconsistencies. There's some inaccuracies. There's some. The one thing that I have discovered in, in, in my studying about the Bible is that even when they talk about when you pull up the different manuscripts and they look at the various manuscripts and they say, well, this one is not written the same way as this one or that one's not written the same way as that one. It's almost the same philosophy as the Bibles that we have today. There are some versions of the Bible that are a word-for-word -word translation. There are some uh, versions of the Bible whereby what they do is they look at what is written in the Greek or the Hebrew and then they try to extrapolate how that relates to our language today. Then there's some folks that will do what they call a paraphrase. They will say it in how they think it is said. But the intention, and see, this is where we get wrapped around. We get so wrapped around the words, we miss the spirit of what's being said. The spirit of what's being said is that you must accept Jesus in your life, and when you accept Jesus in your life, he will make things new. We can't, we can't disagree on that, because that is the bottom line. There was a, there's a saying that talks about, you majoring in the minors, the things that really don't have any e eternal value, you major, you're trying to make those the big things. C.S. Lewis wrote a book that we had to study, and it's called Mere Christianity. And his bottom line was, let's focus on the basic tenets of accepting Jesus in your life, changing your life so that you are conforming to how Jesus has directed you to operate, and let's not get wrapped around all the other stuff. That is what this is about. This is, remember what I said. I, I, we just did the example. Everybody close your eyes and point north. So everybody had a different opinion of where north was. And then when we compared it to where the direction of north, I think one or two people was kind of close to where north actually was. But we must realize, let's not get so wrapped around what my version of North was. And let me look at what the standard is and let me do this. This, this is going to make some folks mad. Let me do some research and study for myself to make sure that I got understanding instead of listening to somebody tell me what I need to understand. That's why I tell y'all take notes. Because just hearing this for this 20 minutes today, this 30 minutes, if I, if I really get happy, you know, a day uh, uh, out of seven days out of a week does not make you grow. It does not cause you to grow. This is an everyday thing. This is a, a, a every situation, a reaction, so that we can constantly operate in the standard that God has set. And then finally, if you only take I'll even give you a whole day. You take all only one day a week and you really grab hold of the God thing and you're really looking at the God thing, living the God thing that one day a week. That's six other days. So we still have an imbalance. And folks say, you know, I hear folks talk about I hear from God. Or I hear them say, I ain't never heard from God. Let me tell you why you can't hear from God. Y'all want me to tell you? Y'all want me to tell you the secret to hear from, hearing from God? You got to know his voice. <laughs> Y'all thought it was going to be something complex. You got to know God's voice. How do you know God's voice? You have to spend time with him. This is why it's very important that I, I tell couples that they got to have time communicating because you have to know your spouse's voice. There is 
uh, let me say, let me do this. When I played football back in the 1800s, and I would be running, I would be running, I played running back back then, and I would be running with the ball. There was hundreds of folks in the stand, but I could tell two voices out of those hundreds of voices. My grandmama and my mama. My grandma, because she was loud, and my mom, because her voice was at a, at a frequency that I was attuned to. Because I spent time with them two ladies. And I could hear them. It could be hundreds of people talking. And my grandmother would say, uh, Tim, and I would be like, somebody just called me. Even today, some of us know that you can be in a group of people and your child could be across the room and they could have the same name as half the folks in there. But they'll say, wait a minute, my mom just called me. Why? Because they know the voice. Why do they know the voice? Because they spent time with the person. There's a God who said he had never heard God's voice and his Bible was just only two feet away from him. Because if you don't spend time in God's word, you will not know God's voice. If you don't know God's voice, then you will not know God's direction for your life. Y'all remember last year in July, I got on that big kick about your 10 minutes a day so that you could hear God's voice clear. That's why it's so important. Because when you hear his voice, he gives you the true north direction and does not allow for your feelings and your emotions to get tied up in it. And as I close, I just want to rehearse in your ear this thing that Paul told Timothy right before he got martyred. He said, all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. And not only that, it will make the man of God complete and equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God. And provides benefit for teaching, provides benefit for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that you may be complete, that you may be equipped for every good work. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. All scripture is given, is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want to be the man or woman of God, a complete man or woman of God, able to accomplish anything, you must get into the scripture. And it will provide you with the guidance that you need, that you will hear the voice of God in every situation. Now, I want to tell you this, and then, and then I promise you, I'm only going to go for 30 more minutes, that... Once you start getting into the scriptures, start leading, uh, learning these scriptures for yourself, what begins to happen is, it's not some outside voice, it's that inner voice that will begin to talk to you about the scriptures that you have placed into your life and will provide you with the guidance. Because all scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, 
may be complete, equipped for every good work. If you want to be equipped, you must do the work. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this word on verifying, validating that your word is true. And because your word is true, it provides us with the guidance, provides us with the true north, the true direction that we may need to walk in, that we do need to walk in, in order for us to be complete and equipped for every good work. Father, convict us, cause us to remember, guide us to seek you in your word so that we can hear your voice clear, that you can provide us the direction that we may be complete and equipped for every good work. That we will operate, God, according to your word, which is profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. We thank you for it. We thank you that it has fallen upon the good soil of our heart and that we will grow thereby. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen.